Hey guys, Ken Smith, Ken Smith Fishing. Um, so I'm actually working on a video for you guys. Got the digital calipers and the super high, uh, the very sensitive scales out. That video is going to come. I've got some more work to do on it, but I think you're going to find it really interesting because I'm finding it really interesting working on it. This video is going to be video number six of the Todd Driscoll uh, interview. Now, if you don't know Todd Driscoll, by the way, there's a playlist on my YouTube site. Um, and also you can find it at kensmithfishing.com on the video tabs. It'll be, uh, there, you'll see all, all of these videos stacked up right there. Todd is a fisheries biologist who works out of the Brooklyn, which is right there by the dam, Texas, uh, Texas Park and Wildlife Fisheries Department. Uh, he is a field biologist and he's over uh, a bunch of our East Texas, East Texas lakes, including Toledo Bend and Sam Rayburn. So if you've not watched any of these videos, we've covered a great variety of topics so far. Uh, stuff like uh, uh, where fish go when they get released or after tournaments. Um, what else have we covered? We've covered uh, giant salvania. We've covered uh, we've covered electroshocking. Uh, sort of what they see at Rayburn and Toledo, how they do that, where they do that, all that cool stuff. And then we've also covered uh, probably one of the topics that was most surprising to me. There's Stella again. Uh, the catch rate, uh, excuse me, the release rate, the harvest rate of largemouth bass on Rayburn and Toledo. We've also talked a little bit about delayed mortality. But this video is the video that started this whole process. So I, I did a video at an Outlaw Outdoors tournament where Todd spoke about uh, taking care of your fish during tournament days and it had poor audio. It's on my website if you want to see that video. But that this is what prompted me originally to want to talk to Todd. And that was talking about fish care and something called a pure oxygen system. So you guys have given me a lot of feedback. It seems like 10 minutes is too short for one of these videos. And anything over 20 minutes, we start losing guys' attention, which I can see from the view rates. So this video has about 16 minutes of content with Todd. We're gonna end this video right before he starts talking about the pure oxygen system, which I think you'll find very interesting. So let's jump over to the video this week. So again, this will be Todd Driscoll talking about tournament or just in general fish care. Here we go. Let's talk about fish care, because you know way more. You, you did a great video. There's another video in the corner right here somewhere. I'll put a link to it. Todd did the other day at an Outlaw Outdoors tournament talking about fish care, but our audio wasn't good. Right. So, so recap for us what kills fish, how to fix <clears throat> killing fish, specifically from the time you catch him, do you put him in your live well until he goes across the way in stage? Most uh, you know, bass mortality in a live well is oxygen related. There's just not enough oxygen in the water. I mean, it's just that simple. Now, let me back up a little bit. Really, two other categories of fish mortality, I guess. You know, the, the fish that we just talked about, you know, deeply hooked. The fish that just bleed out. You know, that's obviously what causes mortality. Deep let me let me stop you right there. Because I got this question. Does Coca-Cola or peroxide or any catch and release or G juice, does any of that stuff to your knowledge help those fish? The hook's out, but they're bleeding bad. Does anything help them? I have no first hand experience. I have I've I've never done that. I I've seen reports of, of people using various, you know, sodas and, and whatnot. I can't really speak to what it does to the bleeding, but I know, you know, the uh, acidic nature of soda, I just can't imagine it, it does the world of good to the sensitive gill fillings. Now, if you truly believe the fish is gonna bleed out and die, I, would, I, would I pour Coca-Cola on it? No, I'm gonna put it in my live well and observe it and, and try to keep it calm and, you know, if the fish is bleeding heavily, you're going to know within 20 or 30 minutes probably whether it's going to, going to make it or not. I just keep it where I'm willing to reserve it. Can I speak to what pouring those substances on the gill filaments actually does to the survival, the survival of the bass? No. I have no clue. You treat your water in your live well. We're going to come back to what else you do, but you do treat your water in your live well. Yes. What do you put in it? It gets back to uh, you know the scientific literature and, and, and what state agencies have done for you know 60 plus years and the research associated with all of that. Uh, I use stock salt. It's S T O C K. It's, it's, stock salt is the trade name that it goes under that you can buy at your local feed store. 
it'll come in a 10 or 30 pound bag. Okay. Stock salt is what it's called. It's non-iodized salt. There, there's another uh, salt, trade name mixing salt. It's got iodine in it. Us fisheries biologists, we just simply don't know what iodine may may do or not do. With fish. There's no study on it. There's no study on it, but common sense using using the non-iodized form, stock salt. Bass and many other species of fish, uh, when they undergo stress, and let's face it, putting a bass in a live well is just stressful. Sure. No matter the oxygen conditions and temperature or anything, it could be ideal. Putting the bass in there is simply stressful to the fish. Mm -hmm. Physiologically, when a bass undergoes stress, one of the main physiological reactions is what I would phrase as osmotic imbalance. The bass simply absorbs excess water through its body cells, through osmosis, that through the cell walls. By nature, a bass's fluids, its blood, is 0.5% electrolyte. Okay. By adding a known 0.5, by creating a 0.5% salt solution in your live well, which is one flat measuring cup per 15 gallons of water. How big is a live well in your Phoenix? Mm -hmm. Most of the live Phoenix, wells, right? yeah. I don't want to say wrong, but they're going to be, uh, I'd say, you know, twenty to twenty-five gallons. So you're putting there. one and a half then in there. I, I take a, a rounded okay. cup, and I take sandwich bags and have pre-measured doses. Just one rounded oh. measuring cup per bag. Put them in a compartment in the boat. It's just that simple. And by doing that, the fish still tries. It still undergoes that excess water absorption. It's physiological. It's just it's stress, that's what it's going to do. The body fluids by nature are 0.5%. You've created a 0.5% solution in that water. Osmosis still happens, but that electrolyte imbalance does not. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's the main ingredient in most of these commercially available conditioners as well. I mean, I have never encountered a, a, a non-biologist type that actually knew why you would add salt or conditioner to a live well. That's the primary reason, is that osmotic imbalance. Okay, and, and Parker Wildlife will not recommend a additive other than that because of the FDA issues, right? Well, it's twofold. One, yes, it's because of the I FDA issues. I keep looking to make sure we're still right. recording, so that's why I look around you sometimes. The, uh, let's be honest, some of these fish that are released after tournaments may very well be eaten. Sure. Or some fish that die and come to the way and get eaten because a lot of times of True. Yeah. We don't know what these various manufacturers, we don't know the ingredients of these chemicals first And, and let me, by the way, since we originally talked, I've reached out to a couple of them. They, they, won't, they won't disclose it? Nope. Yeah. Trade secret. You know, we just, you know, it's not like we, we know there's something harmful or not approved. We just don't know. True. Sure. Period. We just don't know what's in it. So because we don't know what's in it, there's no way we can recommend it. So you have to assume that fish is going to get consumed at some point. Therefore right. You right. There could be chemicals in there that are not FDA approved for human consumption. Got it. Got it. They very well might reduce stress. We just don't know. I mean, there's been very, very few studies on these commercial conditioners. There are a few. But it's so hard because there's so many factors, so many confounding factors that affect live world related mortality, tournament related mortality. It's hard to just single out, okay, let's evaluate this specific commercially available condition and its specific effects. There's so many other factors at play. It's almost impossible to just single it down. But we know one major factor in mortality. So in that osmotic. Well, no, but it's oxygen. Yeah, you know. Salt's, oh, like salt's good to do, absolutely. I do it every time I have fish in the live. I mean, winter, you, summer doesn't matter. Right. I mean, let, let, let's boil this down to what you need to ideally do when you take care of fish in the live. Well, it, it, it's it's just three things: it's osmotic imbalance, it's temperature control, and it's oxygen. Okay. We just talked about the osmotic imbalance. Mm -hmm. uh, temperature. Unfortunately, as water temperature warms. It's naturally by nature at ideal saturation levels, as we would call it. Warm water holds less oxygen. Bass being cold-blooded, of course, as water warms, their metabolic rates increase, they need more oxygen. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there. 
moral of the story is. Dumb question. Does their heart rate increase in warmer water? I would I would think it would. Okay. Yeah. I mean I, I don't guess I've ever, ever looked it, into yeah. it or you know, checked his blood pressure. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, blood pressure cuff, yeah. yeah. But uh, moral of the story is as water temperature warms, the bash require more tension so it's detail. So going, going exactly the wrong direction, right? I need yeah. more and I'm getting less. Yeah, for example, I wrote these numbers down too, the, the saturation numbers, where is it here? Let's see. Here we go. Of course, to a bass, anything that, that, in terms of dissolved oxygen concentration, anything that's five parts per million or higher, it's all good. It's ideal. A bass doesn't care if it's five or twelve. Okay. Anything five plus is perfect. Well, two to five parts per million is stressful. That's going to get a fish weak. Fish may be alive at the weigh-in, but if your live well's been at three parts per million all day and you're not doing these extra things to take care of them, that's allowed to be a fish that dies two or three days later. Hey, do those fish float up? Some do, some don't. Okay. So just because a fish dies doesn't mean you're going to see it. Right. Okay. Below two parts per million is lethal. For folks that, that have a dead fish or two or three, that oxygen got below two. Killed them out there during the tournament. Mm -hmm. You get back to this water temperature, uh, saturation, oxygen level relationship. For example, at 50 degrees, water holds 11 parts per million naturally. At 70 degrees, it's nine. And at 90 degrees, it's seven. So these summertime tournaments, we don't have much wiggle room there. Mm -hmm. Five is ideal. It's seven with no oxygen. Give me the numbers again. At 50 degrees. 50, at 50 degrees, it's 11 parts per million. So okay, ideal. At 70, it's nine parts per million. And at 90, it's seven. Okay. And that's saturation levels with no oxygen demand. Right. You couple bass consuming it, and the moral of the story is you've got less room for air. All right, so I went, I went to University of Arkansas, but I mean, it's just like, so I'm, I'm a dumb question, but it's just like if you put five guys in a sealed room, sure, they're going to burn oxygen. So right. even though you start at seven, pretty quickly, they're, they're smoking through that oxygen. Right, right. The warmer the water, the higher the tournament mortality is. If you just ballpark all the studies, and there's been a ton of studies looking at tournament mortality, enough that it really doesn't need to be investigated. Highly dependent on water temperatures, you would expect. You get a tournament at 50 degrees surface temp, the only fish you're going to have die are those deep hooked fish or those fish that folks didn't fix. Oxygen's plenty good because that saturation level is so high naturally, you've got so much more wiggle room for air. Just running your pumps on a timer would keep it good. By the way, so uh, I'm going to put a link right there in the top of the screen. It'll be your top right, I think of the video where Todd showed you how to fizz. If you don't want to watch the whole video, it's about the last five minutes, but yeah. you teach us how to fizz <coughs> and the right needle. And speaking of which, I had multiple questions about that. You used a really long needle. Yeah. Several guys asked, did the needle need to be that long? I'm assuming it does not. For small fish, no, but for fish five, six plus pounds, yes. And in fact, it, as they get eight or nine plus, certainly. Those needles, uh, the share lunker biology, those fellows that handle a lot of these 10 plus pound fish, oftentimes you can't reach the bladder unless that needle's that long. Okay, good enough. So if you just want to have one needle, why not have it that long? Yeah, okay. And you were using an 18 gauge needle, as I recall. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Sorry I took you off, yeah. but I want to remind guys that that's out there. Yeah. But no, it, 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 at warmer temperatures, you know, in fact, uh, ballpark, looking at the literature, you just pin me down an average tournament mortality rate across the whole year is probably one in four, 25 percent. At some, you know, at, at surface temps 85 plus degrees like we have now, it can easily be 40 or 50 percent or even higher. Now, with that said, that's just people undergoing status quo live well care procedures. That includes me at one extreme doing everything I know to do and includes another angler doing everything I can, oxygen injection, salt, ice, versus someone else who may have had a pump failure and every, everybody else in between. Right. Now, 
water temps get 80, 85, and, and even higher, that tournament mortality rate is probably averaging 40 plus percent. I know Tomorrow. folks may not want to hear that, yeah, no. but just with that whole gamut of fish care treatments, bad to the best, you know, 40 percent or so, looking at the literature and the studies, are, 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 are likely going to die, it may be higher. And for our tournament directors who are watching, three fish helps. Oh, no question. You know, it's just uh, simple arithmetic. So you it's got back three, to you got three guys breathing in that room versus five. And what it gets back, it gets back to, to, to the rate discussion we had earlier, the mortality rate. If you weigh in 2,000 bass, and the mortality rate is 25%. That's true. I thought about that versus, too. Uh, no, yeah. 40% yeah. less with the three fish versus five, sure. well then it's just simple yeah. arithmetic. 2,000 versus 1,200. The same, the same mortality rate, really yeah, yeah, the same mortality rate in the lower numbers of bass, just going to be less fish killed. But we can fix this. Yes. We as anglers can fix this. It gets back to uh, ideal fish care. We already talked about the, the osmotic imbalance, yep. adding salt. Uh, let's talk about temperature first before we dig into the most important, the, the, the oxygen the content. Temperature, the good rule of thumb there is uh, 75 degrees. If surface temps are below 75, really no need in messing with ice to cool the water. That's my general rule of thumb. Anything 75 and over, I'm going to have enough ice on board to cool that live well water down 7 to 10 degrees right in that range. No more than 10. I mean, some people think a little is good, more the better, but uh, you can cool the temperature down enough to where fish may suffer heat shock at the end of the day when they're released back into that warm water. You'd have to get really severe cooling that live well down to actually kill them in the live well. But if, if you've cooled those fish down 20, 25 degrees, you know, let's, let's say the, the surface temp's 85, and you've got that uh, live well 60 or 65, it probably won't kill them there. It's going to be that heat shock that they're not going to like at the end of the day. That's why we don't want to go more than 10. Okay. To know where you're at, you, you really need a thermometer of some type. You can go the cheap route, you know, the uh, Aquarium or pool thermometers, floating thermometers. Sure. Just throw one in there. That'll work. Just floating fine. ducky. Yeah, the uh, auto parts, the, uh, the 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 AC system uh, thermometers that you put in your in your, in your AC vent in the truck. Those will work. Uh, I actually prefer to use uh, electronic temperature sensors. All your major electronic brands will take multiple different temperature sensors, typically through the NEMA 2000 network. So on all my boats. I've got a temperature sensor in each live one. I haven't thought about that. I've got multiple temperature sensors on my hummingbird unit. I could put one right in the water. Right there on your screen. You've got lake surface temps, wow. 85, live well 1, right. live well 2. You can dial it in and keep right at that 7 to 10 all day. As a general rule of thumb, uh, 8 pounds of ice will cool a live well down that 7 to 10 degrees for about 3 hours. I like to... Uh, just freeze a bunch of 12 ounce water bottles. I just keep them in the freezer at home. And you've got a number, you do 30? 25 to 30. Okay. 25 to 30 is enough on the worst at worst day, you know, dog day of summer, bright sun, not a breath of wind, 25 to 30 is enough. And how often do you put them in? Of course, you're, well, watching. you're watching the water temp, so you, yeah. Without that, you don't know where you're at. You don't know whether you've added enough, or you may went overblown and got them, got them too, right. too cold and maybe actually doing some harm with that. Five to 10 degrees, that's where you want to be. The 12 ounce water bottle deal works great for me. I'll throw five in there originally. Five 12 ounce water bottles will typically get it down to about four or five degrees and I'll add three more. I don't throw all eight in there, it just kind of, just, it's kind of crowds of fish a little bit. And after that initial eight, then depending on the day and the sunshine, a couple, three more every hour or two. But again, you watch the temperature on some kind of gauge to know where you're at. So when that water temperature comes down, it literally absorbs more oxygen. Right. It's twofold again, like we talked earlier. You cool the water down, just naturally. Makes the fish need less oxygen. Well, it reduces the metabolic rate of the bass. Right. That's right. And it increases the ability of, of water to hold more oxygen. It does both of those things. There's a, and I don't remember the name of it, a guy brought it up through one of the forums. There's a thing out there right now that's a vent that you can put in the top of your live well. Have you seen me saying? I have. Does 
Do fish give off something in the live well that is bad for fish in the air? I don't know how else to ask that. Are there gases being released by Well, just fish? through simple respiration, right? Carbon dioxide is produced. And in theory, strict theory, levels can get high enough to cause some stress, in theory, but in practicality, they want that live well. I mean, you run those pumps, it's gassing off. It's not a it's not a sealed compartment. Plus, I'm Plus you're open. Oh yeah, yeah, you're yeah. calling fish all day, all right? Day, yeah. yeah. Every time, yeah. So no, carbon dioxide is not a concern. Okay. Now I'm not sure what those vents actually do. I don't I don't really have a gut feel. Uh, well, and, and I looked at them, and I'm I'm not saying good or bad, but. I see the idea of putting some air through there, and, and the, they catch air as you're running down the lake. I gotta think that probably helps and circulate some of that back, but it, I don't think it solves the problem we've got here. Yeah, I mean, just, just how effective is it? How, how much oxygen does it add? Yeah. By That's the way, the I looked line. into buying an oxygen gauge because I want to start doing tests. They're expensive. $1,000, so yeah. unless expensive. Kismet fishing really takes off, we're not buying an oxygen uh, uh, sensor for No, they're expensive and they're high maintenance, too. Yeah, you got to buy the brains for them. Constant ma maintenance yeah, yeah. to keep I, them reading right, but, but yeah. So, you know, temperature control is important. So now let, let's move into the most important aspect, and that's that oxygen level. Okay, so we cut off right there before we start talking about the pure oxygen systems, which uh, Todd's going to go in-depth talking about in video number seven. So this is video six. Video seven will be up very shortly. Again, if you don't know me, Ken Smith, I've got uh, lots of, uh, of videos online talking about subjects like, but well, we did a great series with uh, Glenn Freeman and, um, and Albert Collins on structure fishing. Uh, Clark Ream Turpro talked to us about how to uh, how to work on how to read your electronics. FLW Tour Pro Dickie Newberry talked about his first year on the tour. Uh, we've got uh, almost 40 videos just from this year of, uh, of uh, lake reports from Rayburn. And then there's also a playlist of 2018 lake reports. So you can actually go back and watch what was happening one year ago today to sort of get a sense of what's going to be happening over the next few weeks. So we're building a library of lake reports so that year over year you can go back and watch each year what's happening in July, what's happening in August, what's happening in September, which I think will not just be beneficial to you guys, but I think I'll enjoy going back and reviewing that stuff as well. So uh, lots of good videos. We appreciate you guys tuning in. We really appreciate you sharing. Uh, the, the, the channel has really experienced a lot of growth over the last month or so, and I hope that continues because I'm certainly enjoy doing these videos. So. Until we get back another video, which will be another Todd Driscoll video, and also the video I started this video talking about that I'm working on, that video is probably still several weeks in the work. There's a lot of... That's a dog toy, by the way. There's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes building some videos, but I think I've got some interesting content coming up for you guys. So we'll see you here in a couple of days, and thanks for tuning in, guys.